I've always wanted to play. See, I've always wanted to play basketball. It's one of my secret ambitions. But I never could. I, I don't have that coordination to be able to play basketball, you know. But um, I love to see people. My brothers both played. I love to see women athletes play, you know, because it just, it's extraordinary to me because then I understand it a lot better. You know, when guys play, it's so fast moving. I can't quite understand who's doing what or <laughs> whose basket this is or whatever, you know, but I love to see women play ball. I love to see it. In East Orange, um, it's my hometown. Um, it's sort of like a, um, it, it's something that, where young people, young women, young men, young children, you know, can go and uh, enjoy themselves during the summertime. I mean, they're swimming on the other side. There's a day camp there, you know. There's a lot of things that are happening. And this gives them some place to go and be spectators, you know, like, as if they're going out to the Meadowlands or whatever, you know, just to go and have some fun. Yeah. Yeah, we sponsor teams, you know, um, different people um, in the community, you know, sponsor different teams. And I chose to sponsor one this summer. It's about um, just being a person, being real. And, and I think that's what my community appreciates about me, is that I'm, I can still go back and we can still talk and, and laugh and have fun. I think that if I had come trying to be the superstar, you know, with the fur coat or whatever, you know, with the red carpet rolled out, I think that's when people react that way, you make them kind of want to attack you. It's like a, um, if you come normal, regular, and just, you know, like the person that you are, then um, they don't, they're not so, you know, so ready to, to, to jump you or, to, you know, they want to talk to you. Like, everything's cool, everything's free, you know, it's all right. <laughs> I'm still a person, you know, that kind of thing. Sure, sure. Most of the, Marilyn, <laughs> most of the, um, you know, you saw most of my friends. Well, not my friends, but just people that I know from the community. Um, a lot of them still live there, a lot of them don't. A lot of them come back to play ball. You know, a lot of them come back to, um, just to see one another, just to say hi. You know, it's a place of meeting, I think, you know, especially during the summertime, you know, when everybody's off. You know, it's just a place to come to and, and you know, say hi to everybody, that kind of thing. Well, this house, is my house and I built it. <laughs> I did this house. I bought this house about three years ago. Um, I've just recently, about a year ago, really started to live in my house because I've been on the road a lot. Um, um, during the time it was being done, you know, interiorly and, and exterior, I was on the road. So I designed mostly what I did from off the road. I had the designers fly out you know, come and, and bring me materials, you know, and colors, you know. Before I left, I got the colors all together because I knew what I wanted. And from then, the, the young man who helped me, he would fly out with chairs. It was most incredible. There'd be chairs in my, my, in my suite, you know, and I'd be picking out, hmm, I'd sit in each one and try each one to see which one I love the most, you know. But I actually did it from off the road, right? I really, you know, put this house together with the help of my mother. We did it from Moth Road, and when I came home, which was December of 87, I believe, yeah, that's when I moved in, I gave a, a party for my family, you know, my mother's side and my father's side, and, and everybody came. So the day that I gave the party was the first day that I had actually walked inside my own home, done and everything. So it was really, really exciting, you know, to walk in with everybody and be, I was looking like, like everybody else was. I was like, oh, isn't that beautiful? Ooh. But um, I just started to really, really learn it, really live in it and, and, and feel it as my home. That's right, that's where she lives. She lives in the basement. Most of what um, I really wanted was my home. I wanted a home. Um, everything else that Whitney Houston is and has become, I wanted a special place for that. You know, so, and I, I didn't think of, I didn't think I was trying to separate the two. I just think that I knew I didn't want them mixed in together, you know, because I think it's kind of confusing, you know, after a while. But I wanted, you know, a home. I wanted my home to feel like my home. It's someplace that I could go away from the business and away from the, you know, the entertainment and all that craziness that goes on in my world and just be at home, you know, like I remember when I was growing up, a home. I do that. 
sometimes. It's so funny because today is like really the first day that I, I've been back to East Orange, I mean, in a long time. Um, today's the first day I really drove, like drove my car. I haven't really been out, you know. I've been recording, which is part of the reason why. But um, I do that sometimes. I lock myself up in here and this is where, but it's, I don't feel locked up because I can feel like I can always go out, you know. But I'm comfortable here. I like this space of mine, you know, and I have a lot of room. She sure did. My mother, um, well, she raised us in church. You know, for a while, I know because it's a family tradition that church was a part of our, our, you know, our life. You had to go to church whether you liked it or not, you know. But as gr growing up, I loved it. I loved going to church. I loved to sing. I loved the choir. I loved the whole excitement of going to church and, and you know, that feeling there. Let me try to explain it to you. Um, okay, on Sunday, let's say Sunday, for instance, um, there's an eight o'clock service, there's eleven o'clock service, there is sometimes well you have the afternoon basically off, and then there's an evening service, like five-ish, four-ish, five-ish, something like that. And um, the way the way that we um, we uh, the services run. It's all about a praise, you know what I mean? It's a constant praise, you know, it, it, and it's very loud. It, you know, it gets very, it's joyful. It's, you know, it's, we can't contain ourselves when we're singing. It's like, you just have to let this feeling go, you know. Um, basically, I think that is, if there's any difference between uh, the way people, um, you know, see God or feel God or whatever, it's just the way we praise Him, you know, the way, some people are very quiet about it. Some people are very solemn, you know, very, you know. But in the Baptist church and Pentecostal churches, we can't hold it. We just have to shout. We have to praise his name, you know. <laughs> I didn't know much about him when I was growing up, younger, like, you know, in the, the single number stages. I, I, I didn't really know that. I, could, I knew him through my parents. I knew him through, through my family, you know. I knew him through church. I knew that... Whatever this God was, he sure liked to sing. He loved to love people to sing. He loved to be praised, you know. But as I got older and I started to uh, experience life on my own, there are a lot of things that I understood better and, and a lot of things that the one, my relationship with God drew, became closer. And I became, I felt him inside of me. And... I got to know him that way, you know, um, through my own experiences, through my own life, you know. I'm going to do a gospel album. I'm definitely, I'm going to do many. Um, it's something that you, I can't avoid. It's my root, you know. It's where I come from. It's, it's what, I, what I love the most, really, about music. It's my first introduction to music. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. Got to do that. There, there's a, there's a, a, a form of gospel music which is called traditional, which is the basic hymns, Precious Lord, and, and When the Saints Go Marching In. But then there's a contemporary gospel that you hear B.B. and C.C. Winans sing, and, and the Winans and the Clark sisters, and, and Al Green, and, and people like that, which is more today, which is more universal, which is more uh, appealing to young people, which is, you know, the crowd that, you know, the group that you want to reach. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the secret is, is uh, maybe I have experienced it in some way or another. Um, but even if I haven't, somehow I know someone has. And I can feel that. You know, even if I don't know firsthand for myself what it's like, I can understand it. I can understand how somebody could feel that way about their man or, or feel that way about their relationship with their, you know, just relationship period. I can, I can understand that. So maybe it's because I do understand it, you know, even if it's not my own experience. I'm sure somebody is experiencing it. So I, I put that emotion. I feel people. I try to feel what people are going through. And I'm a person. So basically what I go through, we all go through. Absolutely. You know how I really, I, I, how I really know that a song is very special? When I can take it and I can relate it to my human nature, but also my spiritual nature. All the man I need, 
the words are, I used to cry. I used to cry at night, but that was all before he came. Um, I used to cry myself to sleep at night, but that was all before he came. Uh, but he's, well, anyways, he's, he fills me up. He gives me love, more love than I'll ever need. He's all I've got. He's all I've got in the world, but he's all the man I'll ever need. You know, for me, I can, I can relate that to my God, you know. There is a, there is a love when you, when you know the Lord, when you, when you, when you know God for yourself, that no man or no, no human spirit can really fulfill. It is, it's a spiritual thing. It, it's, it's coming from God, you know, um, which goes far deeper than the human love for me, you know. But all the man I need is a perfect example of um, how... Um, I listen to the lyric, and lyric that that are that that is most appealing to me are lyrics that talk about love, whether love gone bad, love good, love indifferent, but you can still feel the 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 depth of it. You know what I mean? It's just not singing about a relationship, you know, or just you know, oh yeah, he hurt me, he loved me, and I'm he's gone now, you know. But it's a it's what you what you've conquered, you know what I mean, what you, the victory, you know, what you come out with, the strength, you know, the, yeah, I was hurt and I was there, I was sad about it, but hey, life goes on. My mother raised me to be a strong person, you know, um, to stand on my own, you know, to be independent, to never look for anybody, to depend on anybody for anything, you know, uh, depend on yourself, you know, and love God and, and trust in God and, you know, she raised me that way. She used to always say, you know, especially when I hit about 16, she used to always say, you know, you're not going to make it to 17. I can feel it. You're just, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> but, you know, you go through that with your parents. You know, I did with my mother. I didn't, I didn't want to listen to her. Everything she said was like, oh, you don't know. You, you don't know what you're talking about. This is my life. I'm experiencing this. How do you know? I'm experiencing this situation. You're not experiencing this. Little did I know that she'd already been through that. You know, but you know, when you're a teenager, you're growing up, you think you know everything. You know, because it's so brand new to you, it's you think, oh, I got this, you know. But um, that's when she wanted to kill me, when I wouldn't listen to her. I wouldn't, I wouldn't obey her. I think, you know, when I turned 19, I moved from my mother's home. I got real grown up, and I said, well, I'm going to move because I can't, I can't live with these rules, and, and, and you can't tell me what to do anymore, and I'm a grown person. So I moved, <laughs> and I cried for two days. I cried for two days. I didn't realize what being on my own really was until I think maybe a year after moving, I went to my mother and I said, Mom, I don't know what I was thinking about, but when I made that move, I took a big step. She said, yeah. You, you know, you didn't know that? I said, well, I knew that I was taking a big responsibility, but I didn't know how big. And I think then we realized, and I said, you know, and then when you're away from your mother, away from your parents, things they used to tell you start coming back into your head. You know, it's, <laughs> it's wild. And I started to tell her, she said, yeah, but you wouldn't listen to me then because you didn't want to hear anything I had to say. I said, yeah, and I was, I was really being a little imp. <laughs> but... Um, I remember now, and everything you told me paid off. That, that's difficult. That's difficult. Um, you know, your, your father, he wants you to call him. Your mother, she wants you to, you know, call her. And if you pay a little bit too much attention to the other, it gets a little funky, you know. But my parents, I know, I think why it's so strong because of what my, my parents built our family on, you know, on love and, and a strong foundation. So. I never got confused with my mother doesn't love me, my father doesn't love me, or who loves me, or who doesn't love me, you know. I knew both my parents did, and they showed me, you know, that they loved me, you know. And, and that was never my worry, that my parents would break up and I'd have to, you know, divide my love between the two, you know. My mother said, love your father, that's your father, and I love your father, you know, we just can't get along anymore, so we're going to split. But don't feel differently about your dad because he's gone, that's your father, you should love him just, just the same. I know, and I, and I always say, what am I going to do next? You know, and with me, it's like I wear one outfit. I can't wear it again because it's been seen already. You know what I mean? I mean, especially for TV, you know. If I wore that dress and then I wore it at another function, they'd say, oh, she's wearing the same clothes, you know. 
Yeah, a lot of them are. Um, a lot of them are um, uh, French designers. I like uh, Azadine Alaya, um, Valentino. Um, I have a woman, thank God. She's the best. She, I've known her since I was very young, and she's into, she used to be in the fashion industry. So when she got out, she still kept her contacts with people, fashion designers and everything. So she shops for me, and she brings me all the clothes, and I pick out what I want. And she's got the most exquisite taste. That's why you have to know, and my mother, she gave me this, I thank God. She's not colorblind. She's got good feel and good taste for material and color. So, you know, what we think doesn't work. Like, there would be things that she, my mother would put on, and I'd say, how did you get this combination, you know? I mean, purple and orange and, you know. But it would look so beautiful. And I think it's because she wasn't afraid to take the chance, you know, to try it, to see how it looked, you know. And it worked. It worked. Hmm. God. There is a there's a young man that designs for me. His name is Mark Mark Bauer. And he's probably my favorite right now because he knows he knows my body very well. And he knows just how to tuck it and do it and make it fit me very well. So he's probably I don't have a favorite dress, but he's right now my favorite designer. Mm, no, but I'm getting older. I mean, when I was, okay, let's compare when I was 19. I could eat and eat and eat, and I don't know where, the, where it went. It just fell off me like, ah, I didn't even think about running or swimming or anything, you know, like that. Not that I do so much now, but now that I'm older, my metabolism isn't working as fast anymore. No, I have, a, I have a sauna in my bedroom and a, and a jacuzzi bathtub in my bedroom and, and a little gym workout area in my bedroom. So I try to, like, I ride my bicycle. I like to ride my bicycle. That's fun for me, you know, because I don't get to do it very often. So I think, like, twice a week I try to ride. And, I, you know, I run, and when I'm feeling a little heavy, I, I start to work out just to tone up, but never to lose weight. I have no problem with my weight at all. I love fried chicken. I love, you know... The things I grew up on, um, uh, potato salad and, and candy yams, sweet potato pie. My aunt, who, who, who cooks for me, she, she's such a great cook, but she's such a health conscious cook. I get my vegetables, I get my, my, my fish, and I get my chicken, and I get everything that she feels that I need, you know from my, my, my body, you know, and, and if, if, I'm, if she knows I've been working, I've been stressed out. She, you know, it's, it's extra because she knows your body needs vitamin A, you know, or your body needs that protein or <laughs> you need zinc, Whitney. <laughs> zinc. So, you know, basically, I don't need a lot of junk. I don't need a lot of junk. Oh, what makes me angry? Lies. People, lies, meaning the one thing that I hate about this business is that so many things are said about you that aren't true, you know. Um, people take things out of, out of con con context and, and create this own story, you know. Uh, things that you say aren't repeated the same way, you know. Um, people who tell me things like, uh, I, I really hate this, uh, it, it's one of my pet peeves, it's like, I really, really irks me. Uh, I'll call you in an hour. And they never call. Ah. <gasps> that aggravates me. Um, but, I don't know, that makes me angry. Um, child abuse makes me angry. Because for children, it bothers me that children who are, who are helpless, who, who depend on adults for their security and for their care and, and, and for the love, it just, it bothers me, it makes me angry. I've seen children that have been abused. Kids growing up in my neighborhood, a lot of them were abused. You know, you have a situation where, um, let's say, the mother takes in a boyfriend, the mother takes in a stephusband, you know, or his husband and stepfather to the child, and they don't get along. You know, I have a lot of my friends didn't get along with their stepfather and um, were hit, you know, hit a couple of times, beat, thrown out the house, that kind of thing. Pretty tough, yeah. 
Yeah, we lived in Newark first, and, and then the riots took place, the 60s. And... Oh yeah, absolutely. I remember lying on the floor and eating off the floor for the bullets, you know, the bullets were flying, we'd go through, sure. I grew up in the ghetto. <laughs> I mean, that's where I grew up. Well, after the riots, my mom and father worked so hard to try to get us out of there, and they did. And then we moved to what was called basically a middle-class section, you know, middle-class black people and a mixture of white people. You know, then as the years went on, the white people moved out and the black people started to move in, you know, and then it became, you know, a different situation. You know, you had more black people than white people. And you had people coming in from New York, coming in from Newark, which, you know, you get, you get different, different mentalities, you know, different tempers, different angers, different this, you know. And it made it a little rough, you know, and it started to get a little rough. And, and then we had gang fights, gangs coming in from across the town, coming over to our, our, our part of the town because uh, a guy messed with his sister. He's got, his sister has ten brothers, and, <laughs> and ten brothers come across town. That kind of fighting, that kind of, kind of violence, nothing really heavy. I mean, not, it wasn't as bad as it is now, not, not the drug violence that it is now. It's a whole different violence now. Then it was, you called me a bastard, or you called me this name, and I'm going to get you, you know, and we'll meet at so-and-so time, you know, that kind of thing. But now it's different. It's real, real big time. It's very, very young people playing adult games, you know. Kids carry guns now, and, you know, just that kind of thing now. It's different.